Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel, welcome back to another episode. My name is Dr Alex George, you're joining me here in my bedroom, in my flat or the place I'm staying in, in London. In today's video I'm going to be doing a Q&A. So a lot of you will have seen on my Instagram that I announced I was doing this Q&A and asked you guys to send your questions in so I could answer the things that you wanted to know. And I've genuinely done that. I know some people uh, adopted their own uh, Q&A questions. I'm actually going to be answering your questions questions you sent in. I've screenshotted them so you'll see uh, the questions on there. If you're new to my YouTube channel, I do a lot of content around health. I'm an a &E doctor, uh, but I do TV, uh, media work, podcasts, and YouTube as well. So check out my YouTube channel for more health content. I really hope you guys can enjoy today's video. I'm going to be answering as many questions as I can in, a, in as open and honest way uh, as possible. I hope we'll give you a bit of an insight and hopefully some interesting things you didn't know. So let's get on with this video. Take a seat and get started. Come on. Right, so I have my phone uh, on me and I'm going to be going through um, some of the questions I've screenshotted to answer them for you guys. I know it's been a video you've been asking me to make for a long time and so I'm excited to make it and do this now. So let's get started. Uh, I'm going to do these in quite a quick fire way so we can get through quite a few. What was your very first car? So my first car was actually a Vauxhall Corsa. So big up anyone that's in the Vauxhall Corsa crew. Uh, loved it. It was black with like silver alloys. Uh, I felt very cool having that uh, and really lucky to have that as my first car. And actually, I'm very fortunate obviously to have quite nice cars now. Um, I love my R8 and stuff, the Mini. Um, but I still think your first car is a special experience. It's such a nice feeling. I don't think you can actually ever top that feeling of going, I've got this freedom. It's my new car, so um, amazing. Vauxhall Corsa crew, there you go. Did you have to give any medical aid in the villa? Um, so basically, when you're in Love Island, there's a um, there's you go through all the kind of medical checks and things as you go on to onto the show. But there's also a first responders, first aid, um, paramedics, uh, and some doctors are available essentially if you're unwell, if you need any treatment. Obviously, you're spending a long time. In, in the villa itself and actually uh, each day people need to take medications they have treatments for different things and so um, one of the medical team will come in in the morning and the evening commonly to give any medications that people need to take they take regularly for whatever reason but then of course there's situations that happen like the baby challenge uh, when you're running along with a pram and you trip up and you cause yourself a big bruise and you might need to be looked at and checked over I actually didn't need checking over I had a look at myself realized I'd be fine it was mainly my uh, pride that was damaged but a lot of people did come up to me of course when people realized as a doctor I had Jack Fincham ask me about 20 questions a day ranging from uh, if your nail falls out will it grow back um, how far can your eyes see what happens in a c-section all sorts of questions of course people did ask me things like can you have a look at this I just cut my finger or whatever if it was something very simple uh, I would say look don't you know necessarily waste their time in this situation but of course you've got to be careful because there's correct ways to do things there's insurance and things like that so I just direct people to see the uh, the medical team but it didn't stop people asking as I say had a lot of uh, medical questions and very interesting ones along the way as well next would you go on to another reality TV show now I get asked this quite a lot and it very much depends on the show I really like challenging myself I did Master Chef and it was like about cooking and things and um, I, I kind of see that if I was to do any further kind of reality TV it would need to be something that really challenges me either mentally or skill wise or physically anything that would challenge me really I'd be interested in doing since I was young I always like to kind of um, push myself and whenever someone says oh, you can't do something Alex or you know this is this is something that's be too tough for you it always makes me want to do it even more I want to succeed I want to prove everyone uh, you know wrong um, I wasn't actually the quickest at school but I wanted to be up there and train and get faster and faster and, uh, and, and prove the point kind of thing so I think that element of competitiveness um, in me means that I, I would probably enjoy certain kinds of uh, challenging reality TV shows shall we say is it difficult balancing such a challenging job and your social media presence now I think one of the things that surprises people that was that before Love Island I had no real social media following. I think I had like two or three hundred followers on Instagram. I might have posted a couple of pictures in the pub with my mates. I wasn't really fussed about social media too much. And I went on the show basically because I was asked um, to go for an interview. I was very hesitant for a long time and wasn't really sure about doing the show at all. Um, even though I loved Love Island, I love watching the show. Uh, and in the end I decided to do it. When I came out, I never expected to have such a big social media following. I remember the night that I left the show in a minibus, me and Alexandra were back on the way to the airport to fly home to the UK, having just done Arts and Live from the villa. Uh, and I looked at my phone, because I'd only just been given my phone back after nine weeks, and had like one M 
on the Instagram and I was like, 1M, I was like, 1 million people. 1 million people. I mean, I, I was actually, I felt a huge weight on my shoulder actually. First thing I felt was like a weight, I was like, all these people are following me. Um, what do I do? Like, what now? You know, what's the responsibility of this? It was quite overwhelming, I think, at first. Um, a lot of people on that show already had big social media followings. You know, they already had a presence online. They kind of knew how to handle it. For me, it was very new. I didn't have a manager. Hadn't really thought of that before. Uh, and so it's been a learning curve. But over time, like anything, you get used to it uh, and you learn how to kind of use it in a positive way. I, I had a decision to make. Either I use social media and just try and make loads of money and go to club PAs and I do all this stuff, or I can try and use it for the passions I'm interested in. And that's what I wanted to do, and that is what I've tried to do in the last two years. So yeah, it can be a challenge balancing that with my job being a doctor because the two worlds are so different, but I think I'm getting there. I'm getting there, you know, in terms of balancing it. I think actually if it's done correctly, you can do really positive things with it. So yeah. Now I'm gonna answer this question because, um, look, I'm very open with you guys. Uh, I always try to be as honest as possible and share with you the things that I'm kind of going through. Uh, and obviously like I'm going through, I've gone through a breakup uh, recently in the public eye, which is not something I ever really um, thought about and it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I've got a huge amount of respect for Amelia. We broke up in a very, very amicable way. Um, uh, and and so I don't want to really kind of comment too much on that, but I will answer this question, uh, or one or two questions on this, and I hope I can just bring out something that people might be able to find um, kind of helpful in a broader way rather than commenting necessarily on my kind of relationship and situation. The question here I've got is, did lockdown contribute to the end of your relationship? Um, lockdown's really tough. Uh, I think whether you're living um, together in a couple in, in the house and you're isolating together and spending a lot of time together, or whether you're separate in different locations, it's really, really difficult. It's a long time to either spend apart or spend together. And in either circumstance, I think you can put a lot of pressure on a relationship and no one's immune to that. So I think it definitely would have played, it, played its part. Um, I was under a huge amount of stress with coronavirus on the front line, trying to kind of be a voice of kind of what was going on to people at home uh, and also being away from each other so long. So it was really tough. Um, and so, of course, I think it would have played its part. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of people out there that are probably in a similar position. Uh, and I'd say don't be too hard on yourselves. You know, things happen um, and in life you've got to be able to pick yourself up and move on. I think from that question I'm going to tackle um, a second one around that, which I think actually I hope can be quite beneficial to people. So um, how do you deal with a breakup? I think what's really important when you go through a breakup is being able to remember who you are, what you're about, um, learn to kind of love yourself again, be happy in yourself again, uh, and only then can you really move forward. It's important to reflect when anything happens in life, it's important to reflect on what happened, what was good, what was bad, what you can learn from that. And, and, and not be too hard on yourself. People are so hard on themselves, especially in breakups. Oh, this happened, it's me, da da da. You know, however, you know, am I good enough? These kind of things are, are, are negative. They, they don't help and they won't help you move forward. It's much better to think, what can I learn from this? What can I take as positives from this? Take the happiness out of it as well, the good, good times, the good things that happened, and move forward. And don't regret. I think regretting in life is a big mistake. Don't regret and don't resent the really, really important things. Don't regret your relationships because you learn from them and you kind of develop yourself and you move forward as a person from them and don't uh, resent people uh, because everyone is who they are, everyone's different. Uh, we're all trying to get through life in our own ways and it's much better to wish the best for someone and move forward. Right, so that's, those questions are kind of over. So I'm gonna leave that in terms of relationship stuff and we're gonna go and talk about some other topics. This is a great question. What are you going to always remember about the lockdown? Um, I think there's a lot of things I'll kind of remember. Um, it's not something I ever expected to happen in my career. I mean, this pandemic, I think when it first happened, I, I did some interviews on it, I said, look, let's not panic about this, not like kind of run away with what's happening. Let's take things steady and monitor it. I don't think anyone really expected it to kind of get to where it was, to be a full-blown uh, pandemic, a full uh, lockdown. So. Um, a lot of things I've learned from it. I think one of the things is um, how important it is to work together, um, you know, to look after each other, to look after your family and friends, how important it is to love the people around you and make the most of your time, because um, it's so precious. You know, I have seen a lot of people pass away. Um, you know, I work as an A&E doctor, we see these things anyway, unfortunately, but 
it, of course, there's a lot more of that during uh, COVID, as, as everyone kind of knows. Uh, and you do realise how valuable life is and how much we should be living, you know, in the moment with the people around us and valuing our life. The biggest thing personally I learned is that we're a lot stronger than we think we are. I spend a huge amount of time on my own. Um, often alone when I'm dealing with very difficult things, dealing with a lot of pressure um, in different circumstances and I learned that actually um, you can be much stronger than you think. Believe in yourself, um, be confident in your own company, enjoy in your own uh, uh, company and always know that you're not actually ever alone. There's always people out there that you can talk to that can support you. If you could go back in time and relive one moment of your life so far, what would it be? Wow, now that is a, that's a corker. Um, I don't know if I can give one moment. There's a few that I particularly would relive. Um, graduation day was one of the best days of my entire life. I mean, I wanted to be a doctor since I was very young, probably 13, 14. Um, I went through quite a lot getting there. Um, I obviously have dyslexia, which is not something that's actually was known in education um, for multiple reasons. And so um, academia in the way of like writing essays, written exams was very difficult for me. Um, I've always been bright. I think I was always known to be intelligent, but I really struggled with all that side of things. So I worked so hard to get the grades I needed to go to med school. And actually I missed out on my med school place by two marks because my coursework was dropped, which is something I really struggled with in chemistry, otherwise I had the, the grades I needed and I had a place in med school. And I had to take a year out, redo a coursework piece for two marks uh, and redo all the interviews, and all the things you had to do for a med school to get my place. And thankfully I got it uh, and I got into it and it just meant so much more when I got to the final hurdle and I got through med school and I was on graduation day receiving, you know, my BMBS uh, with distinction, which uh, I was very proud of. I think that moment was was up there. What job would you have done if you didn't become uh, a doctor? Well, I think this one's not really surprising to anyone. I'd love to have been a racing car driver. Uh, my granddad used to race in motorsport um, uh, on carts and also motorbikes. My dad used to work on motorbikes as well on carts. So I, I would love to be a racing driver. I think the buzz of the adrenaline, the speed, going around a Formula One track would have been amazing. So definitely would have been a Formula One car driver. I know that's very different to being a doctor, but I would have loved it. Was there a point at work when you actually feared for your life due to the coronavirus? Um, yes, I think there was definitely points at the start when we, when we kind of were going in um, and seeing these patients, we didn't really know how bad it was. We were hearing all the horror stories from Italy and other parts of the world. Um, we didn't know as like doctors and nurses and, and other professionals like, what would happen to us? Would the PP work if we caught it? How sick would be would be be? So yeah, quite scary. And definitely when I had some colleagues around me who were unwell, um, uh, that was that was quite scary as well. But actually, the PP does work, um, and we quickly realised that if you're very careful, if you wash your hands, you follow the steps, and you can stay safe. But still very scary. Where do you want to be in five years time? Um, I always like to have a five year kind of goal, a five year plan because I think it's really important. When you're looking forward in your life, you know, you, you only get one shot. So having some idea of where you want to be, I think is important. In the next five years, I want to have written uh, a book. I want to do more and more TV, uh, health work, investigative uh, documentaries and stuff around health, frontline, A&E, those kind of things. I want to have done more series of my podcast, uh, The Waiting Room. And I'd like to establish myself more on YouTube as well. I want this channel to grow so I can talk about how Health much more. On a personal level I would love to have uh, my dream home in that time uh, and I would also like to travel the world a lot more as well. There's a lot of countries I haven't been to. I want to go to Australia, I want to spend time in Australia, the Golden Coast uh, and yeah enjoy life plenty. You know I've, I work very hard and I want to have that kind of side of things as well and just live life to the full. Does fame affect you mentally sometimes? Um, I have to be honest with this, yes of course. Um, there's a lot of pressure with being um, famous or known, um, you are very much in the public eye, which you kind of choose, and there's very good things about that in, in terms of what I can do, and obviously the health things, I get very excited about different projects I'm doing, very lucky to attend certain events that, you know, I wouldn't have dreamt of being able to go before, uh, and of course I'm able to, you know, enjoy things like the cars that, you know, maybe I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So there's some real positive sides, but sometimes it's hard, um, the kind of scrutiny, uh, people being aware of your kind of life all the time, you know, your relationships being very much exposed. Um, it's very tough, I think, in that sense. Um, but I find that, you know, bringing it back to why you're doing it, the why uh, is so important. And I think as long as the why 
is worth it. So the reasons that I am on social media, the reasons I'm on TV are worth it. Uh, and I'm able to kind of get real satisfaction out of that then the downsides are worth it. You know, the trolling, the nonsense that you get sometimes is well worth it. Do you think that you become desensitized to death over time working as a doctor? Um, I think it's a very good question. And I think you do learn to cope with it more. Um, when you first kind of experience death, it's a real shock, something you're not used to. Um, but as you see more of it, you're able to kind of compartmentalize. You're able to kind of objectify the situation because I always say this to people, if you work as a doctor and you're in A&E, you're in environments that you see a lot of bad things and you're not able to kind of deal with that and manage it in the right way, emotionally and mentally, then you can't really perform your job as a doctor because if I was to become like catastrophically upset every time someone died, right, which some people might think is the right thing to happen, would I be able to be effectively looking after my patients? Would I be able to go from a cardiac arrest to seeing the next patient five minutes later who's come in with an ankle injury? You know, would I serve that patient well? Um, if I was constantly being, you know, really upset and brought down with other things. So you do become in some element desensitized. Doesn't mean you don't care. Doesn't mean you don't care. It's just the ability to put that in compartments. Uh, and of course, like there's certain things I see, and especially during coronavirus, that of course they upset me. We're all human um, and things really do shock you, but you definitely become more desensitized probably than you were before. What would you say the hardest thing you have to do within your job is? So I think the toughest thing that we have to do, I think, is speaking to uh, breaking bad news to people. So either telling someone, uh, you know, that they've got a really bad illness or that they may be going to pass away is really, really tough. And telling the relatives as well. Uh, and it's something that you have to learn through med school. First, by observing, you see people doing it and hopefully doing it well. You see some people maybe doing it not as well. And you learn from that as well. Uh, and you get this toolkit together that you learn then how to approach a situation where you may be involved in that conversation and eventually that you will have that conversation. One of the things that was really, really difficult during the coronavirus is that usually we would make someone feel as comfortable as possible having their family around them, you know, hopefully to pass in a moment of comfort and not being able to do that um, and actually being telling their family they can't come in, uh, certainly in the early stages was really tough because you felt really bad. You know, I. I don't make those rules, I don't make the situation. It's not something I can change. It's not a decision actually for me to make, but you still feel really upset by that and it feels awful telling you know, a daughter that they can't see their mother you know, to pass or say goodbye. It's just, so that was really hard. That's the hardest thing I think I've had to do uh, in my career. Now let's finish on a real positive. It's always good to do that. What was the greatest experience of your life? Um, I have to say that the greatest experience would have been uh, Love Island. It was just incredible. It was a once in a lifetime experience. There's very few people uh, in the world that will ever, ever kind of know how it felt to be in that show. Uh, it's a unique experience you can't recreate, you know, knowing that every day there's millions of people around the world watching you sit there uh, and have a cup of tea by the pool. It was something just incredible uh, and so different to my normal life. Uh, and of course, it's allowed me to do all these kind of things that I'm doing now. So I feel very fortunate and it was an incredible experience. Thank you everyone for watching uh, the video. I hope it's been useful. Thank you to everyone that sent in questions via the Q&A. Um, I'm sorry if I haven't answered your, your question. I've gone through as many as I could have. Uh, I'll do another one another time soon if it's something you guys be interested in. Please remember to uh, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, and if you have any particular questions you want answered, I'll try and answer them in the comments below as well. Take care everyone. Have a good day and goodbye.